Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now and new on the night beat a case at exclusive a city councilman found lying in his backyard a cut on his head and smelling of alcohol now that councilman being investigated for his suspected role in a hit and run accident and we broke this story on ksat.com just over an hour ago and now garrett Berger joins us live with the details so garrett break this down first what do we know well, we have a redacted police report, this one right here actually, describing the hit and run crash at Jones Maltzberger and Redland Road on Sunday night. Though the suspect's name and address are redacted in the report, law enforcement sources confirm that District 10 Councilman Clayton Perry was the one believed to be behind the wheel. Northside Councilman's the lone conservative on the dais, known for his focus on city basics like infrastructure and, coincidentally, police. I'll take you through it. According to the SAPD report, at about 9:10 Sunday night, a Jeep took a turn too wide and smashed head on into another car, causing major damage. The Jeep left the scene, but a witness followed it. When the officer checked out the location, he found the Jeep still running and parked where it had hit the garage. He heard moaning from the backyard where he found Perry lying on the ground with a cut on his head. The officer wrote Perry was slow to answer questions, unsteady on his feet, and confused about events of the evening. When he asked Perry questions, the councilman refused to answer or gave vague answers. The officer said he smelled an odor consistent with alcohol coming from Perry, who said he was not driving the Jeep that night. Based on what he knew at the time, the officer said he left without further action, meaning he didn't test Perry's sobriety or arrest him. However, he talked later with a witness on the phone who described an older white man getting out of the driver's side, wearing similar clothes to what the officer had seen Perry wearing. But the officer decided Perry had fled the scene of the crash and listed the offense as failure to stop and give information, a Class B misdemeanor. Because they can't prove he was intoxicated behind the wheel, though, the case will not be investigated as a DWI. Now, we made numerous attempts to further confirm Perry's suspected role in the crash, but city staff stonewalled us and referred all questions to SAPD, who did not respond to our, our follow-up questions other than releasing that first report. Now, Perry's office has not responded to our request for comment from the councilman. However, when a reporter visited his home tonight, a half mile from the crash scene, he saw a slightly dented garage door. And Perry's Instagram and Instagram page show, shown here shows him in a black Jeep Wrangler like the one described in the report. Now, as of airtime, we haven't found any record of Perry being arrested on the, in this case. We have reached out to the mayor's office as well for comment. All right, Garrett Berger, thank you so much for that report. Now, Perry has been on council since 2017 and he is up for reelection this May. We've got some breaking news tonight as well. Investigators releasing a suspect sketch in a sexual assault investigation that began on Halloween. Bear County deputies say this is the man they are looking for in the case. Investigators say he walked through an open garage door into a home in the Lucky Ranch subdivision. Now, this was on Davalos Lane. Investigators say that the suspect got away after the sexual assault. He's described as being five foot nine with a thin build and a possible scar over his eyebrow. So if you recognize that person, call Bear County deputies. That number is 210-335-6000. Now to a night beat update. Investigators making a disturbing discovery today. Deputies pulling a car and a body from a creek in southwest Bear County. Pieces of that car actually left behind. Investigators confirm the car is connected to a missing persons investigation that began last week. Investigators say it is linked to the disappearance of 25 year old Austin Wiseman. That car found in about two and a half found about two and a half miles from where he was last seen in Somerset. We heard from his family last night today. They were too shaken to speak. Now, investigators have not released an identity for the body found at the scene. It will be up to the medical examiner to confirm the details in this case. Of course, we'll keep you posted. A place of peace, a church disturbed by a deadly shooting, but it's not the first time that violence violated what a church has stood for. As the night team's Patty Santos reports, a San Antonio pastor is now calling on faith leaders to join forces against violence. I just went through this. I'm not over this. No one gets over gunshot or any of these type of horrific violences quickly. 
Bishop Rosa Wilson reacts to the news of a church shooting around the corner from her own place of worship. In 2021, shots sent parishioners running at one of her own church events. A six-year-old was among those injured. Our children are being traumatized. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder is real. And it happened again. San Antonio police say 24-year-old Lyndon Seymour was shot and killed outside Storehouse Ministries Sunday on WW White Road. There were children in the vehicle, but no one else was hurt. Children should not have to live in fear. They should grow up. It, it shouldn't hurt to be a child. Last year, Wilson started STOP, a movement to end gang and domestic violence. Tonight, she's calling on Eastside Church leaders to unite and join her calls. We have five fingers, open, single, individual. But if you place these fingers together, you close them, we have a fist and we're stronger. We need you. It's time to get involved. And she hosts the Stop the Violence rallies monthly. The next one is on November 17th. That's at Greater Faith Church on MLK near WW White Road. Police are looking for the people involved in the deadly shooting of Lyndon Seymour. Patty Santos live from the newsroom. Thank you, Patty. A blast downtown has the FBI looking into this case. Texas Public Radio captured this blast on their surveillance camera. It was right outside their headquarters, though this isn't their property. It happened next to TPR about 3 a.m. this morning on West Commerce near Cameron Street. A man seen placing an object under this sculpture of L Vladimir Lenin's head, then walking away before it explodes. No one hurt, but investigators trying to figure out what happened during this case, why this happened, and learn more about the suspect involved. And now look at some of today's big headlines in your night beat news flash. One man accused of arson, carjacking and robbery. The string of incidents ended after he was shot in the head. San Antonio police believe that it started when the man set a stolen car on fire at a gas station near Perrin Vital and Perrin Central. Officers say the man then stole another car and drove to a strip club armed with a rifle that was near Loop 410 and McCullough. Investigators say a security guard shot the man in the head. That suspect was then taken to the hospital. A jury did not convict a man in the death of 16 year old Sebastian Diaz. Mario Duarte's attorney says it was self defense. Now, prosecutors said that Diaz was in a Northside apartment complex to sell Mario Duarte and his cousin drugs. The defense argued that Duarte saw a gun and feared for his life and then fired at the teen. Duarte's cousin, Julian Vera, still faces a murder charge in this case. Diaz's family says that justice was not served. And we're just hours away from the polls opening for Election Day. And for the first time in more than 20 years, voters are going to pick a new Bear County judge. They're also going to pick the next governor. Polls open at 7 a.m. tomorrow. There are going to be more than 300 places in a Bear County to vote. We have listed those sites for you on KSAT.com. By the way, polls are going to close at 7 p.m. tomorrow. After that, we invite you to watch the Night Beat for all of the results. And that's a look at your Night Beat News Flash. And new tonight, doctors said he would never walk again. Or did he prove them wrong? A year later, the young victim of a drive-by shooting can stand on his own two feet, even run. The night team's John Paul Barajas caught up with Romeo Aguilar, his mother, and a few special friends they've made along the road to recovery. Step-by-step, five-year-old Romeo Aguilar continues to do the impossible. First, he survived a shooting. Then doctors believed his spinal cord injury would rob him of the ability to walk. But Romeo proved them wrong using a walker within weeks. He don't use that walker no more. Let me tell you, <laughs> that walker is ooh, long gone. Just over a year after the shooting, Romeo's mom, Rosella, says his recovery's been great. No, you can <laughs> And he's able to enjoy more time just being a kid, like stashing away candy. I hide them so So your little brothers can't steal them from me? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But Romeo's journey is far from over. He slightly drags one foot, and they're still doing rehab to build strength in his legs. We went trick-or-treating, his legs got tired, and like they just give out. They don't give him a signal, he just starts falling. So we use the wheelchair for them long outings that we have. The mental battle is just as hard, if not worse, than the physical for Romeo. Rosella says he was diagnosed with PTSD and has nightmares. Screaming about... Get me out the car, they're shooting me. 
The day-to-day -day struggles are made easier with community support and friends made along the way, like an Elmendorf police officer. He's a lucky young man, he's a strong young man, and like I said, he reminds me of my son. They look just alike. <laughs> so that's why, you know, when I saw the story, you know, I had to reach out to her. And San Antonio rapper King Kyle Lee. He's a soldier, we soldiers together, and our community, man, we gotta keep fighting for one another. Stop the violence, stop the stupid stuff that's going on. The family says that support is among their many blessings. We make every day amazing because we still get to wake up to him and we get to tell him we love him, you know? Rosella says she has forgiven the people responsible for the shooting, but that she will never forget what they did to her son. As for those suspects, at last check, police still have not made an arrest in this case. At Public Safety Headquarters, John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Glad to see Romeo doing so well and making such good friends. Thank you, John Paul. A beer can thrown during the Astros parade today, where it landed and the man arrested after all of this coming up. And what was sold as an event to bring smiles to Uvalde, now losing steam. Why the victims' families are now distancing, distancing themselves from the fundraising effort. It's next on The Night Beat. New tonight, the families of the Robb Elementary victims distancing themselves from a fundraising effort announced just one month ago. Yeah, we told you about this. As the night team's Lee Waldman reports, they want their loved ones' names and faces to be separated from the Balling for Uvalde World Weekend event. It was a larger-than-life announcement on October 13th. Look, there's going to be two events in 2023, the Super Bowl and the Balling for Uvalde World Weekend. Trust me. That now seems to be losing steam. When KSAT 12 News originally reported on the Balling for Uvalde World Weekend event, it was promised to be a celebrity soccer tournament and music festival. Organizer Nathan Baller promised the money would go toward a state-of-the-art recreation and wellness center dedicated to the 21 victims. You're going to have the Leila Salazar you know, track. You're going to have the Eva Miralev conference room, the Jeff Rivnos playground. Now, 20 of the 21 victims have sent this cease and desist letter asking Baller to, quote, not use the names and images of our loved ones to raise funds or for marketing purposes, unquote. It further states their families will not participate in his events moving forward. They're not alone. In a phone call on October 13th, Baller said he'd be working with Evaldi Volunteer Fire Department because of their 501c3 status. Today, Patrick Williams, the president of the Volunteer Fire Department, says that's no longer happening. Additionally, the city of Uvalde issued a statement that read in part, quote, the city will no longer entertain Mr. Baller's efforts. In the event, Mr. Baller presents a proposal through the Uvalde Forever Fund that is properly vetted, the city will support any such venture, unquote. As for the celebrity star power promised. Talking to Bad Bunny, you know, we, we, we're talking to him, we're talking to Dre. None of the artists he mentioned are listed on the Balling for Uvalde website. A press conference to announce the details of the event that's slated to happen in February was canceled yesterday. Now, I was in contact with Ballard tonight. He said he'd be willing to give us an update later on, saying it'd be better to talk after the election. Reporting live, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. We'll continue to follow it. Thank you, Lee. A problem at today's Houston Astros victory parade. Crowds lined the streets to celebrate the World Series win. The police arrested at least one man in the crowd. They say he threw a beer can at Senator Ted Cruz, who was on one of those vehicles that was going by. Police said the senator was hit in the chest or neck area, did not require medical attention. The 33-year-old suspect faces assault charges. Now let's take a live look outside right now just to look at the roads there the i-10 a 410 interchange where there's a whole lot of nothing going on much like the powerball situation yes we told you we were going to give you those numbers tonight we can't give them to you because the powerball people are saying that they need extra time to complete security protocols a lot of money on the line i guess 1.9 billion dollars yeah and of course if they draw them before the end of this newscast we will bring them to you uh, you can find it also on KSAT.com once they're drawn. But there are going to be a lot of people suspicious about this. You know Yeah, that, right? of course. Of course, sir. I mean, it goes off without a hitch every other time, right? Yep. 
I don't know. I'm not. I'm not saying anything. Yeah. I didn't even get a ticket. It, it was a one in two, three million chance. Yeah, one in three million. Three hundred million. Three hundred million. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Three hundred million. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> yeah. That's why I don't get the ticket. Um, anyway, uh, let's take a look at our uh, headlines here. More fog tomorrow morning. A little bit of drizzle and dampness. Then a pot potent cold front's going to hit us Friday morning. So. A lot of the same really the next few days until we get to Friday. That's our transition day with the strong cold front and that's going to set the stage for the coolest afternoon since March 12th. That's pretty significant and right, we're going to talk about the temperatures in just one moment, but let's talk about today and look how close we got to record high temperature. Actually, 87 was our high today, not 81. 87 was our high temperature today and we had 500 of an inch of rain. Yes, 500 of an inch that gets us so much closer to 1917. We're still in first place as the driest year on record, at least year to date, but we're creeping up to 1917. I don't like being first place in this category. All we need is 600 of an inch and we're in second place. I mean, we could get that, squeeze that out any morning here, uh, basically the rest of this week. It's just not all that likely to happen. We had a few of those streamer showers today. Uh, picked up 500 of an inch of rain at the airport. That's all we could muster officially in town. But there were some pockets of our area that had over a quarter to half an inch from some of the downpours. But that was the exception, the extreme exception. Big upper level swirl. You see that counterclockwise swirl? That's a big trough, the big dip in the upper level flow over the western U.S. We've been in this pattern, repetitive pattern of these big troughs digging southward to at least give us a shot at rain. This one will help develop a cold front that's going to move through on Friday, but odds of rain are pretty slim with it. Tomorrow, it's more of the same. Low gray clouds, a little bit of fog and drizzle. Notice I started our future cast at 4 a.m. That's shortly before the total lunar eclipse reaches totality. Unfortunately, I think odds, odds are heavily against us being able to see that because of the low clouds and the fog quickly filling in overnight tonight. Even a few spritzes and sprinkles, you see these little green dots the future cast is painting. It's in agreement that we'll probably have a little bit of light precipitation throughout the morning and even into the afternoon as we get some sun. We can't rule out one or two little pop up showers here and there in some random locations. There is that possibility, but overall we're not looking at uh, much in terms of accumulations, not Many of us actually seen the real showers. Low clouds are already starting to fill in. You can see that in the live camp. Dew point is 66. It is sticky outside. It's going to remain very humid until Friday afternoon. Once that cold front arrives across the state, 60s and 70s for most of us. Laredo still at 78, but 68 in Kerrville, 73 here in San Antonio. Tomorrow morning, 68 degrees, a few degrees lower in the hill country. Kerrville, Canyon Lake about 64. Then by the afternoon, we make it back into the mid 80s for most of us. Von Army 84 along with Elmendorf. Downtown San Antonio about 84 degrees. Then some upper 70s in the hill country. More of the same through Thursday, mid 80s. Friday we transition 73 degrees. And then boom, we're down in the mid 50s for highs by Saturday and Sunday, mid 50s. So tomorrow, again, a little damp to start the day. Then we'll squeeze in some afternoon sunshine. More of the same through Thursday. And then Veterans Day, that's when the cold front hits. And you're going to feel it this weekend with a few showers as well. Windy and a bit raw on Saturday. Ready oh, for it. Yeah, Jack I'm ready for it. it. Make some chili. Yeah. Oh, ready for it. yes. I'm all about it. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, we need the Spurs to do one of these. Snap out of it. Well, I'll tell you what, they're playing much better tonight, unlike they did on Saturday night, which was the second game of back-to-backs, and you're playing in the Mile High City. Right. And for a lot of these guys, it's the first time they've ever had to do that, right? So when we come back, they are playing much better. We'll check out on that score here in just a minute. And the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys first returned to Green Bay since becoming the Cowboys head coach. Coming up. San Antonio Spurs return home to the AT&T Center looking for a little revenge against the Nuggets after Saturday night's blowout loss in Denver. First quarter, Devin Vassell comes up with a steal, finds Keldon Johnson all alone for the baseline slam, barely high enough for the dunk, but it counts. San Antonio leads 13-6. Then late in the frame, Josh Richardson lobs it up for Charles Bassey for the alley-oop slam, just called up from the G League. We're tied at 28 all after one. Second quarter, Doug McDermott comes alive, knocking down a three-pointer for a 38-35 lead, but the Nuggets answer back a few minutes later. Nikola Jokic Scores inside, and Denver leads 65-62 at halftime. Let's update the score now in the fourth quarter. The Nuggets are only up by three, 96-93.
Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Fresh off their bye week, the Dallas Cowboys prepare for the struggling Green Bay Packers, who are in the middle of a five-game losing streak. The Cowboys, who are now 6-2, and two, will face the Packers, who have dropped to 3-6 and six, this Sunday at Lambeau Field, a place where Cowboys head coach Mike McCarthy used to call home as a head coach of the Packers for 13 seasons that included winning the Super Bowl in 2010, ironically, in Jerry World. Now he gets ready for his first trip back to Green Bay since becoming the head coach of the Cowboys. Obviously, you know, I have great memories um, about about Green Bay, and you know, obviously, spent spent a lot of time there. But you know, I mean, I'm, I'm four years removed uh, from from working there, and um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to taking our team up there. And, and you know, like I told them today in a team meeting, that you know, this is a this is a really cool place to compete. Um, so it's obviously, you know. Uh, a lot like you know AT&T Stadium. I mean, we have a, an unbelievable stadium that people enjoy coming to compete at, and it's uh, you know very similar up there. You know, obviously the history and tradition of Green Bay and Lambeau Field, and you know it's an experience that um, you know I want them to maximize. And but most importantly, we, you know we're going up there to win the game. All right, kickoff on Sunday at Lambeau Field will be at 3:25 p.m. And KSAT 12 Sports will be there. The Fighting Texas Aggies will have a chance to snap out of their unexpected five-game losing streak when they travel to Auburn this Saturday. It's a team in similar shape as the Maroon and White, with both teams at the bottom of the SEC West. Both are 1-5 and five in the SEC, just 3-6 and six overall, are on a win list on the road, and both are on a five-game losing streak after the Aggies fell to Florida 41-24, and Auburn lost to Mississippi State 39-33 in overtime, and they have already fired their head coach, Brian Harson. Is Jimbo worried about keeping his young recruits together long-term now that the transfer portal has changed? the landscape of college football. Well, they, they've been very happy. We've had conversations about it. They're excited about where they're going, what's happening, the future, what you're doing, and we talk to them every day about it. We, as a matter of fact, two of them come up today because I know we're short, but, man, we're going to be a good team. We can still be a good team this year. We like where we're going as a future. They like each other. They practice together and spend a lot of time together and unify. I don't. As crazy as that sounds, you worry about that all the time, whether you're in or not, but this team is a very – tight-knit, very unified group of guys. Knows you best of that young group. All right, kickoff on the road for the Aggies will be at 6.30. The big game and our big game playoff coverage Friday night. You will also able to be seen live on KSAT 12. Come up. The big game and our big game playoff coverage is Friday night. We'll feature the number six Reagan Rattlers hosting number 10 New Braunfels Unicorns to kick off by district play. And get this, you'll be able to see this game live on KSAT 12 on Friday night. The Rattlers come into this first round playoff matchup after winning district 28-6A with a 24-9 victory over Brandeis and Cole Pryor rushing for 208 yards and three touchdowns with a stout Reagan defense. Held Broncos quarterback J.C. Evans to just 121 yards in the air. No touchdowns in the air, giving up only one on the ground. Meantime, the Unicorns arriving in the playoffs after going 7-3 overall, 4-1 District 27-6A, with their only loss to number one ranked Steel and coming off a 40-14 victory over Judson. Now the two meet to decide who moves into the next round of the postseason. They run the ball. They like to play hard-nosed football, and they're going to try and out-physical you. And I mean, they've, for the most part, done that this year and proved that it works. Got a lot of momentum behind us. Keeps the trend on tracks. I mean... Just got to focus and play like we did last week. Definitely a more mature football team on both ends of the ball, watching film uh, after our first scrimmage early on, uh, first week actually, and I think we're both going to come out, have a good fight, uh, starts in the trenches with us, and it uh, will be a good game. All right, kickoff is slated for 7 p.m. at Coma Lander Stadium with our pregame show slated for 6.30 live on KSAT 12. Holding that World Series wow. trophy. There you go. To the victor goes the spoils after winning their second World Series title on Saturday night in Minute Maid Park in Game 6 against the Philadelphia Phillies. It was time to celebrate some more today with a victory parade. It was held in downtown Houston over a two-mile route where fans could cheer on the Astros and share a title. A first for Dusty Baker as a manager. And good luck to San Antonio FC. They are playing for their first ever USL championship against Louisville City. That'll be Sunday at 7.30 at Toyota Field. Pack the place like you have done so well in this postseason for SAFC. Boy, they did it last weekend. That was great. Yeah. Just great. And we'll be right back in two minutes. Tomorrow morning, it's 68 degrees, low clouds, some fog and drizzle. Can't rule out a few light sprinkles, but uh, probably not as much as what we saw earlier this morning. Then we'll squeeze in a little bit of afternoon sunshine, making it to 84 for the high temperature. More of the same Wednesday and Thursday. Friday, Veterans Day, that's when the cold front arrives. 73 Friday afternoon, cloudy. Saturday, Sunday, we're in the 50s for highs. So make the chilly get ready for a cloudy, cool, almost winter-like weekend. Sounds good. Powerball numbers still haven't been released, but we'll have them on our website when they are. See you tomorrow.
Please vote. Yes.